Hey, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com here. Here happens to be in my home garage shop once again. And uh, welcome to the midweek episode of Stumped Q&A. What the heck is Stumped? Well, great question. <laughs> Every weekend I put out a video and usually within a day or two, there's plenty of questions <laughs> posted on the video that make me want to go back and take another stab at my presentation. So Stumped is all about uh, following up and looking back and answering your questions, comments, and cheap shots. This weekend, we talked about Jack the Stripper. That's this little jig slash fixture right here that's used for ripping thin pieces of wood. Um, turns out uh, it was pretty straightforward, and, uh, and pretty much all the comments were just straight up. Hey, I got a project that, that can use this. You know, that's a great idea. So th with one exception, and uh, we're going to talk about that exception a little bit today. And that, uh, that came from Chad. Chad, always nice to have you. Always nice to have you comment. But uh, Chad threw out the idea that you could add to the bottom of Jack uh, a couple of those T-nuts. The T-nuts from ShopSmith are little, like little miter bars almost that we can attach to jigs and fixtures to lock them in place. His thought was, well, maybe you could use that and, and actually have, instead of the rip fence in place, just have it running in the miter slot. Now, I immediately dismissed it, and I said, no, that's silly. I mean, we've already got a great rip fence right here. It's designed to do what it does, and uh, we're ripping, so let's, let's not overcomplicate things. And then for days now, I have been thinking about that idea. You know, what are some of the positives? What are some of the negatives? And... Um, you know, I, I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> but here's my first instinct and why I, I kind of shot it down. Um, it, when it comes to jigs and fixtures, I like to keep them simple. The idea of having one jig that does a bunch of different things, just uh, it, it, it's hard to get them all to perform well. Now, you might think that's ironic coming from a guy that uses ShopSmith equipment, but you got to understand the, uh, the original ShopSmith, the Model 10ER, was designed for around the idea of simplification. You know, why have five tools in your shop taking up space? Why dedicate five motors, five spindles? Because all of them, you know, have a spindle of some sort that spins. And uh, Hans Goldschmidt, a German engineer, thought of, well, what do these machines all have in common? And they have that spindle in common. And, and is there some way we can mount the spindle in a work table to perform all the various functions? So really, the shopsmith is, is designed around simplification. Now, let's talk about jigs and fixtures. I, I, I had a class years ago when I was working for shopsmith where uh, we were running the machine through its five basic functions and building something. Think a table. And I had a student got pretty upset that we were using jigs and fixtures. And uh, I, I pulled him aside and said, what's going on? And he said, look, I just spent $3,000 on this machine. And uh, now you're telling me that it can't do the things I need it to do without me having to build or buy more things. And I thought, you know, th this, this guy has a fundamental misunderstanding about tools and woodworking. Did you know that the very first circular saw was invented by a shaker woman? She was watching a couple guys working in a pit saw. That's a saw where you, uh, uh, the operation, you, you dig a pit, you roll the log over that pit. One guy jumps in the bottom, one guy stands on top, and you use a saw that is going straight up and down. And it's only cutting on the downstroke. So the guy on the bottom is having to pull the saw down through. I, 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 if, we, if we were given that guy a name today, we would call him the dust collector. And, and then on the upstroke, the guy on top is having to bend down and lift the saw back up into position, not doing any cutting on the upstroke. So it was a, it's a reciprocating saw. Goes up half the time and down half the time. So it's only cutting half the time. Well, as the story goes, this gal was working on a spinning wheel and the wheel is spinning and she's spinning yarn. And uh, the thought occurred to her that if you had a round saw, you would have a continuous motion of cutting. 
So they created that saw and guess what? The very first time they used it, I'm sure, they discovered that, you know, maybe this would work better if we had some kind of a work table to run the material across. So they added the table to that saw, creating what we know today as a table saw. Okay, well then years went by and uh, as, as the uh, folks used it, they started to realize that, you know, it makes a lot of sense to have some sort of a straight edge to guide the material past. And then that way we could have a cut that is uh, multiple cuts that are coming out the same width. So the rip fence was added to the table saw. The first miter gauges that I'm aware of actually ran with the rip fence or ran along the edge of the table because table saws weren't made to accommodate a miter gauge. It was only after they gained popularity that they started making tables with miter slots in them. Each of those things from the table to the fence to the miter gauge are fixtures and jigs that were added to the machine. Now, we wouldn't think that it's a table saw without a rip fence or a miter gauge or some cross-cut table. Um, and so it's just jigs and fixtures go hand in hand with woodworking. Now, to give you an example of, of an overly complicated jig and, and a lesson that I had to learn for myself, let me show you something that I frequently was using in my shop to make cross-cutting easy. So there's nothing unusual or extraordinary about attaching a piece of wood onto the miter gauge. Um, it's something that's so common that miter gauges are made with either holes or slots in the protractor to make it easy for us to add jigs and fixtures. Um, I'm often just adding things to my miter gauge using double-sided tape. Now, what double-sided tape? That matters, actually. Um, I use in my shop two different kinds of double-sided tape. This is Spass Caps uh, Speed Tape. This is a very tenacious double-sided tape. If I'm joining something together permanently, that's the double-sided tape I use. I also use a product called Spec Tape. And if I'm gonna join something together temporarily, um, maybe pad sawings, putting several pieces together to cut out on the band saw or the scroll saw, I prefer to use spec tape, and spec tape is what I would use to attach this to the face of my miter gauge um, if this was just a temporary fixture. Um, years ago, I found it handy to take a second miter gauge, and I just happened to have a couple miter gauges, and insert that in the other slot and join these two together using spec tape. What's interesting about that is it functions like a cross-cut sliding sled. Um, I can now, with this pistol grip, have control over both pieces of wood as I make the cut. And uh, typically what I would do is I would take this piece and rip it at an angle so that as I pushed it into the saw blade, uh, I'm sorry, as I pushed it into the saw guard, it would ride up and over easily. Now, the nice thing about having a piece of wood on your miter gauge is once you make a cut, you will then have a saw kerf that you can align your marks to for making your cuts. So I used this so much that I decided it was time to make something dedicated to this. And so, oh, first thing I did was I added Bittner nuts. I drilled and countersunk carriage bolts, put Bittner nuts on it and joined these together. And then it happened. I needed to cut a miter, and cutting a miter this way works pretty slick too. I can rotate both miter gauges, as you can see, get them both at the same angle, and, and lock them in, and make the cut just as before. The problem was with Bittner nuts and carriage bolts here, and Bittner nuts and carriage bolts here, that distance increases as the miter increases. So went to the drawing board and came up with this. So as you can see, this is designed on one end with Bittner nuts, that's the fixed end that would go here on the left. And then on the right hand side, I have T nuts running in an aluminum extrusion. Um, you'll notice how much action this thing got, right? No, no saw cuts in it at all. Because after I got done designing and building this thing, I realized how ridiculous it was. 
I had spent so much time creating this that I never really stopped to think, <laughs> do I need it? How necessary is this thing? So it was right around this point in the design phase that I realized this. All right, so are you seeing the problem? Yeah, where I've got that miter bar uh, positioned, I'm going to cut right into it as soon as I make this cut. Uh, I could reposition that, uh, screw it in another location, but I realized after I got this far how over-designed this thing was, how much hardware it was taking, and I was getting by just fine using double-sided tape. I love interesting jigs and fixtures and tools. I love shop-made tools. And if they solve a problem for you and they gain you some repeatability, accuracy, safety, um, and in this case, potentially flexibility, go for it. But I also like sticking two-sided tape on things, putting them together, and getting all that great accuracy and safety, and then throwing it away when I'm done. Um, I can get the job done fast. I'm not wasting time building jigs and fixtures. I'm on both ends of that spectrum. You can be too. There is no shame in that game. Just do what makes sense and works right. So um, I'm still thinking about this, Chad, and I think I'm going to come up with a new version of Jack the Stripper. I will share it once I do, and uh, we'll, de we'll decide whether more complicated, more bells and whistles is worth the additional effort or not. But uh, thank you for making me think. Hey, in the next video, we're getting back to the bandsaw, so be sure not to miss that. And in the meantime, make it a great day.